Hello, and welcome to the LuxCast. Today we are taking a break from our Faith and Vocation series to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, a pivotal moment in church history. A few weeks ago, leading church historian Dr. Mark Knoll visited Holland, Michigan, to give a talk called The Reformation as Blessing and Bane. The following day, he sat down with fellow historian Dr. Mark Baer to discuss Luther, church unity, and commemoration versus celebration. Well, Mark, thanks so much for being willing to do this. This yeah, is a real blessing. Uh, I'd like to start off with a question that I think has been on your mind because you addressed it last evening. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, Christians, some Christians at least, are going to celebrate what is probably an imagined event. That mm -hmm. is to say, mm -hmm. Martin Luther walking up to yeah. the door of the... Yeah. Castle Church in Wittenberg and nailing his 95 theses on it. Doesn't matter whether it's imagined or not. We're gonna, we're gonna take October 31st as sure. the beginning of the Reformation. So you spoke yesterday about the Reformation as both a blessing and a bane. And just share with us your thoughts about the Reformation's long-term legacy. Well, if, particularly for Protestants, historically, the commemoration of Luther's birth, 1517, were celebrations. And, and understandably, but uh, it seems to me commemoration is a better word for what Protestants, Catholics, non-Christians should do. The effects of the Reformation were tremendous, uh, comprehensive, spread throughout Europe and eventually the world. And from a Christian angle, there are many good things that happened. Uh, it seems to me that the uh, opening up doors of authority to lay people, certainly from a Protestant point of view, making the scriptures more available. Mm -hmm. uh, and then particularly, uh, the emphasis upon God's grace from Martin Luther, John Calvin, other leaders. But there were also real problems. Jesus in John chapter 17 prays for the unity of the church. The unity of the church is fragmented uh, in, the, in the wake of the Reformation. Um, the Protestants opened the Bible to uh, everyone and everyone read the Bible, often to their own uh, satisfaction <laughs> and not with the considerations of, of unity. And, the, and then the, the, the role of lay people it was certainly magnified, which was a good thing in many ways, but it also led in some occasions to uh, secular rulers taking a much more aggressive stance over against uh, the church, which, which would have begun in some ways the process of secularization that we see, see to this day. So mm -hmm. commemoration, yes, definitely. Elements of celebration, probably so, but sobriety above all. Okay, good, thanks. Um, what's your sense of the importance of the printing press to the Reformation? Mm -hmm. I, I recently read that it, in, a, in a survey in 1515 of the top 100 professors in German universities, including Luther's, mm -hmm. Luther's name is not mentioned, mm -hmm. 1515. Mm -hmm. uh, seven or eight years mm -hmm. later, he was the mm -hmm. most right. published author right. Right. in Europe. And everybody knew his yeah. name. Yeah. Just, just a few years later. Is it an accident that the modern publishing world and the Reformation as a modern event mm -hmm. happened together? Mm -hmm. Is that an accident? No, I, or? no, not an accident at all. I mean, the, there'd been, what, 75 years or more of the printing press, and, and actually, people think about Martin Luther as a translator of the Bible. There'd been several printed German translations of the Bible. But the uh, combination of a sharp voice, but then a culture that was in effect tinder, waiting to be uh, uh, ignited, made Luther a phenom. Uh, real nice book by Andrew Pedigree, recently published, Brand Luther. Luther became a, a kind of uh, icon. Uh, what, what Luther published, or what people published by Luther, became interesting even by his, his opponents. So the printing press had, had existed, but it made the Reformation a transformative effect and, and helped it spread because it was, it was books and pamphlets, much more than personal contact that in the early years of the Reformation made Protestantism a European-wide phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So would you say that, that Luther's critical importance in launching the Reformation was as a writer as opposed to Luther, uh, a charismatic leader? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, and, and, and even in some ways an inadvertent writer. So the 95 Theses, which were promulgated on October 31st, maybe not nailed, uh, are in Latin. And it was only when enterprising printers had them translated into German that they became a sensation and were able to uh, ignite 
the resentment that had built up, not just against the kind of over-the-top uh, activities of the church, but then the agents that were supporting the church, uh, and, and their translation and dissemination, often without Luther's uh, permission, were, were the really key factors in spreading his message and then letting other people do what they wanted with that message. Thanks. So we've both spent our entire professional lives in the academy. Yeah, I'm right. curious about what you think about the Reformation's impact on the history of higher education. Uh, I'm reading a book called Restoring the Soul of the University, mm. and the three right, authors' right, right. argument in one place is that the Reformation's impact was negative. Uh, that is to say that by formally unified mm -hmm. universities now being divided between Catholics mm -hmm. and various versions mm -hmm. of various Protestant denominations, uh, that that was a bad thing. I'll just quote them. By its very nature, the denominational university posed a particular problem for the idea of universal truth and wisdom. So rather than strengthening the medieval university's mm -hmm. purpose, which was for students to learn to love God, mm -hmm. these guys argue that in some part, uh, what the Reformation did was to lead down the road mm -hmm. of secularization. I'm just curious about your thoughts. Yeah, so I, there's certainly something to that argument. Whether it's the university structures or the, um, the secular rulers deciding that they would be reformed or that they would be Lutheran or that they would be Catholic. And of course, the secular rulers were also the ones in charge of funding and, and establishing the university, so the, the issues are, are connected. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so sure that the uh, decisive move was uh, Lutheran universities, Reformed universities, Catholic universities, um, because the newer universities eventually, I mean, there, was a, there was a short period of, of confusion, but they, they too had a view of knowledge as entire and, and universal. I would say on the 17th century when um, relig religious wars continued, conflict between Catholics and Protestants, conflict amongst Protestants continued. In that period, then, I think you began to get a, a search for other authoritative sources of knowledge. Descartes in the 17th century, the new, the, the new mode of thinking. Uh, Newton in the latter part of the 17th century. And then uh, the, a general turn to somehow you thought, well, empirical investigation or serious investigation of the human mind would give a stable platform to re repair the unity that the churches had broke. I think that that process too factors into it. But, but certainly there, there was something to the, to the division of thinking that accompanied the division of the churches. Thanks. So I know, his, I know professional historians are not supposed to do this, but I'll just go right ahead and do it. The, the what if question, yeah. and I'm thinking about Christendom. Yeah. Yeah. Would there still be a Christendom had there not been a Reformation? That is to say, did the Reformation as well as undermining the academy helped to undermine the idea of a polity being yeah. connected to a commonly understood worldview, yeah. uh, those kind of connections. Yeah, yeah that is a really good question. I, th I think in the, the, in the long term, the answer is yes. Um, the idea that you could have an integrated belief system, practical institutions that all were based upon a common view of Christian truth, that, that idea is hurt by the Reformation. But I don't think it happens right away because all of the Protestant movements to become well-established are mini Christendoms. Mm. So if you're in Wittenberg, you're going to be a Lutheran Christendom. If you're in Geneva, you're going to be a Reformed Christendom. If you're in England, they, of course, fight back and forth, you're, but you're going to be a Church of England Christendom. If you're in Scotland, you're a Presbyterian Christendom. So the, the idea of integrating religion and everything else sus is sustained, but sustained at a local level instead of universally. And that, that then eventually, I think, w will prompt the uh, dilution of the strength of Christendom, but it, it lasts for a long time. And I, I think there are Christendom elements that actually, to the, some extent, they survive to this day. The Kirchensteuer in Germany, where, where, where people can have part of their income tax given to the churches, that's a legacy of Christendom if there ever was one. The, 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 the uh, Queen of England being, uh, her, having her position in the Church of England is, is a legacy. These are very thin legacies, mm -hmm. but, but they do continue on. Okay, good, thanks. Um, why do you think Luther attracted so many followers, some of them elite members of society, yeah, yeah, some of them yeah. common people, when to voice support for a heretic yeah. and an outlaw yeah 
could be a very dangerous yeah, it could thing. Could be, yeah, indeed. Well, that is a, a good question. It's one that uh, people in this commemorative year are working on because there's a lot of attention to Luther, but then in some ways the bigger question is why does Luther have the I impact um, that, that he does? And I think I would say that what what Luther promotes is a conception of authority. My conscience is captive to the word of God. He promotes a, uh, a clarification of the Christian gospel, justification by grace through faith. And he, he also eventually comes with a, an ethic about how life should be lived in the world. You're going to have civil authority take care of one kingdom. You're going to have the church authority taking care of other kingdoms. So Luther's reform is multifaceted, and there are many possibilities for mm. people latching on and saying, I've been prompted by Martin Luther. In fact, th there's so many that before very long, as, as you know, Martin Luther says, these people say they're following me. I, I, I repudiate these people. So there are different elements. So some people uh, appeal to the conscience. Some people appeal to the Bible. Some people appeal to the new view of justification. Some the, the new view of church state arrangement. He, he was, he, had a, a, he appeared on the scene with the printing press and the explosion of, of uh, information where many people were, were worried about developments in the church. A, a sharp critical voice could be heard, but that sharp critical voice was going to be heard in multiple, in some cases, contradictory fashions. And Luther was that sharp critical mm. voice. So that there were many Luthers. There were many, right. In at least, as, yeah, yeah. maybe not in his own mind, but certainly in, in the world that uh, ab absorbed Luther and is aware of Luther. Yeah. I know you've done some thinking and writing lately about things global as opposed to where a lot of your work yeah, was yeah. in North America. What do you think the global impact of the Reformation has been? Well, that is a good question. And, and in this 20, uh, 2017 year, there have been some good books by people, Christian people from outside Europe and North America who did not experience the kind of divisions uh, early on in the Reformation and for whom Catholic Protestant divisions are much less important than they have been historically here. I think Lutherans around the world are, are still uh, fixated upon what justification means. Uh, I had a, great, a really great paper by a student at uh, Notre Dame who studied Lutherans in Tanzania and Mozambique. Mm. They believe in justification by faith, but they think justification has to include uh, aspects of e economic and social structure as well as, as well as the relationship between humans and God. Chinese, what the Chinese make of the Reformation is probably going to be very important as, as Chinese Christianity becomes more important. I, I think there, there you will find people seeing the need for reform always being a necessity, mm -hmm. always being required in the church. I wish I could say more because I think this, this topic, how will non-Western Christian communities regard what we consider the signal Christian events in the West is going to become increasingly important. You once wrote a book called, Is the Reformation Over? Well, yes, the simple answer is no, <laughs> because all Christian groups need to be constantly reforming. All Christian groups need to be going back to the standards in the scriptures and then the well-honed traditions of their, of their communions. The prompt for the book was, was the dramatic changes that have taken place in Protestant Catholic relations since the Second Vatican Council. And in that sense, the deep antagonism, the kind of instinctive vehemence that Protestants showed to Catholics is, is for the most part over. And in that sense, the Reformation appeal for reform in the Catholic Church is over. Not because the Vatican II, post-Vatican II Church is Protestant, but because it has taken many of the steps, defining the Church as the people of God, appealing more to the Scriptures, relativizing Church tradition over against uh, the authority of the Bible, uh, focus on Christ is the answer. And th these are not Protestant instincts, but they come pretty close. Mm. And in that sense, the, the, the great antagonism of 450 years is, is pretty much past. So the theme of this year's LuxCast uh, series is civility. I want to ask you a, yeah. a difficult question because as I have thought about Luther, he doesn't strike me as being no. a particularly civil <laughs> no, man. No, as, no, I, yeah. as I think not about some least. of his comments to to his enemies, yeah, but yeah. also to people like yeah. Zwingli, who, yeah, yeah, who should have yeah, been allies. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the, the, the sort of infamous thing he had to say about Jews in right. one, on right, one yeah. occasion. And, um, I mean, I, am I misreading him? Was that just the no, nature no, of the times? No, or? no, no. Uh, well, it was the nature of the times. I mean, ve vehement rhetoric. Uh, Martin Luther castigated 
uh, his, his colleague Karlstadt had him exiled from uh, Saxony and then Karlstadt comes back during the night of Luther's wedding and Luther says, come on, stay at our house, which he did then for several weeks. So there was a different, different approach to uh, public speech, but uh, there was an awful lot of in incivility and it hurt over time. It's one of the things I think that made the, the silos in Protestant history because people who had agreed, who could agree that Catholics needed correction could not agree amongst themselves and treated the, the other Protestants as if they were still crypto-Catholics. And, and that was, that was uh, unfortunate. And I'm, in my view, maybe I'm too, too uh, much overtaken by modern conception of civility, it was a sinful practice. It was just wrong to be treating even your opponents as if they had nothing to offer. So maybe the lesson for us today is that civility is a pretty important virtue if you want to think about the church as being unified and, and our relationship with our Stick neighbors. Stick to your so principles. On. Honor others as made in the image of God. Believe that you do not have all the truth and lighten up. Mark Knoll, thank you very Remember much. It. Thank you, Mark.